Hey everyone, hi, hi, welcome. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited for today because today the long list for the Women's Prize for Fiction was, was announced, <laughs> the long list was announced. We have 16 books to dig into. Um, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. This is such a fun literary prize to follow and I was counting down the minutes <laughs> to, to when this long list would be announced and it's finally here and I have some thoughts. I also am going to be, you know, not only just talking about my thoughts but initial reactions to the list and what I think about it so far. I actually don't want to rush myself for this video. I want to take my time and really give you all some um, accurate and thorough synopses, I suppose. Um, so I would imagine that you could grab a cup of tea, cozy up, um, or a cup of coffee, or some sort of beverage <laughs> and a snack, and we can go through this long list together. If this is your first time to my channel, then hello, hi, I'm Shelly, I love love literary prizes. Um, most notably, uh, the, the Women's Prize is one of the prizes that I follow that I, this is my second year following it with quite a bit of interest. And you know, so this is a big day for me. And um, if you love literary literary prizes, if you also, also love books and reading, um, and a really good book, I really love a good book that I can sink my teeth into, that gives me a lot to think about, that entertains me in a wonderful way, then you've come to the right place. And I would encourage you to subscribe and stick around. And I always forget if I have actually said my name by the time I'm done <laughs> talking about this. So hi, my name is Shelly, you know, nice to meet you all or welcome back. Um, so yeah, so let's just jump, go ahead and jump into this long list. Clearly I'm excited. I am going to go through the Women's Prize list one by one, but I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview first. So I have left some space here so I can insert some pictures because I actually don't own any of any of the books. I also did a pred predictions video and my predictions video had a bit of a twist on it. My twist was if these books, the books that I was predicting, if they end up on the long list, it'll be very, very hard for me to resist buying them or getting them from the library because I already have an interest in those books. That was the gist of it. So I only like predicted <laughs> the books that were truly like tickling my fancy. And there was one book that made it and when I, I'll, I'll mention it when I get there. So for some sort of overview stats, Barbara Kingsolver um, and Maggie O'Farrell are veterans to this prize and they have been um, nominated once again. Barbara Kingsolver won the Women's Prize in 2010 for her novel Lacuna um, or Lasuna, I'm not sure how you say that. And then Maggie O'Farrell won in 2020 for her historical fiction novel, Hamnet. Now in 2023, Barbara Kingsolver is um, awarded or was long listed for her novel, Demon Copperhead, which is a play on David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. And I didn't predict this because I'm actually not super interested in reading it. Maggie O'Farrell, um, and again, I will get into more detailed synopsis in a, in a little later, like a little bit of the video. Maggie O'Farrell, she also was is a veteran to this prize, a, a winner, um, a previous winner, and she is being nominated for The Marriage Portrait, which is a historical fiction novel. So um, there's also two novels that are told from the perspective of animals and they read as anthropomorphic fables. So that is um, No Violet Balu Baluya's Glory, her book Glory, which actually popped up on the Booker's long list and I believe it was shortlisted as well. Um, and this is supposed to be a play on Animal Farm by Jar George Orwell. And then also, um, 
let me think, what is her name? I'm so sorry, y'all. Laleen Paul, who is a British writer, she has a book that was long listed and it is called Pod and it is told from the perspective of a dolphin. Now, interestingly, we have nine debut authors and some of the, um, some of the more notable debuts are gonna be I'm a Fan, um, Children of Paradise, so it's Sheena Patel's, I'll go back. Sheena, I'm getting too excited. Sheena Patel's I'm a Fan and Camilla Gradova's Children's Children of Paradise. We also have Jennifer Croft, her book Homesick, which made it on the long list. But Croft has actually been awarded um, an award not for her original writing, but for her translations. Jennifer Croft, you might know, is <laughs> the translator um, who won for, let me, give me one second. She translated Olga to Kirchhoff's, she's the translator for Olga to, to Kirchhoff's <laughs> books. And her more notable books, Olga's more notable books are Flights, Flights and the Books of Jacob. And both of them were, um, noted or honored in the International Booker, which I believe, I see the International Booker as a prize for both um, the writers of the original, um, of the original work and the translators because it um, honors works in translation. And of course the translator is a huge part of that. So uh, Jennifer Croft is not new to the writing scene, but this is her first novel. So I'm very, very curious about that. Y'all, I'm so excited. Okay, so the breakdown of where the authors are from. We have seven British authors, five American authors, one Canadian, one Zimbabwe American, and one French. And my thought was that what, I feel like this is a very homogenous group. You know, we're seeing um, British and American writers dominate, I mean, truly, we have one Canadian and one French writer and that's it. Um, we don't even have any Irish writers. We, yeah, we just, we're not seeing a super diverse list. However, what I feel like they are lacking in diversity of right, like nationalities and cultures um, in this long list, I feel like they're making up with debut authors because nine debut authors is a lot when we only have 16 books for the long list. One of the things that's really important for me and my budget um, is that these books need to be available to me through my library. I'm not sure, maybe one book will get in and amongst me and I will want to buy it, whether by the audio version or by the Kindle version. I don't know and there's nothing particularly calling to me, but if I'm interested in, if I'm interested in it, I'm, I would love to get it from the library. And so immediately I split the long list into two categories the books that my library owns and the books that my library does not own. And so I'm going to present them to you in that way. The first book on this list is Black Butterflies by Priscilla Morris. Now this is a debut, um, this is Priscilla Morris's debut, and this is what it's all about. In Sarajevo, um, which is the capital of Bosnia, it's spring 1992. Each night, nas nationalist gangs erect barricades, splitting the diverse city into ethnic enclaves. Each morning, the residents, whether Muslim, Croatian, or Serbian, um, push the makeshift barriers aside. So in this book, we're following, um, it looks like a teacher and an artist named Zora who send her mother and husband to safety in England. Um, and she's reluctant to believe that hostilities will last more than a handful of weeks. So she stays behind as the city falls under siege. And that is what we're walking into. Weirdly enough, my library doesn't own Glory by No Violet Bulawayo. And, um, and so I was, I was a little bit surprised. So this is a book that's not available to me. And it is, um, it is about an oppressive regime in the fictional country of Jidada. And we are going to be following this very, um, let me think, what was the word? We're going to be following its tyrannical leader. I don't know why that really escaped me for a moment. 
It is a um, satirical novel. It's a story that very much echoes Animal Farm because the um, characters are anthropomorphized and it falls under political fiction. This is one that I've heard enough about it that I don't feel very interested. The main critique I've heard about this novel is that the way she, the, there's no real reason, there's no rhyme or reason as to why she used animals. The author used animals versus um, people and the animals don't seem to coincide or have any connection with the personalities. It just seems like it's a bit like she only did it just to do it. That's the main critique I've heard and that was enough to kind of keep me at an arm's like length distance away from this book. Another debut author we have Fire Rush by Jacqueline Crooks. This cover is amazing and this is what it's about. So Yamaye lives for the weekend a man girlfriend <laughs> when she can go raving with her friends at the crypt which sounds the crypt sounds like a place that would be named in Buffy I think it doesn't spike in Buffy live in the crypt okay an underground railroad in an industrial town on the outskirts of London where she was born and raised a young woman un unsure of her future the sound of her guide a chance to discover who she really is in the rhythms of those smoke-filled nights in the dance hall darkness dub is the music of her soul her friendships and her ancestry but then y'all no, that's not it. It's not just about her friends and partying up with smoke-filled nights, whatever that means. Um, <laughs> but it changes, everything changes when she meets Moose, a man she falls deeply in love with. Of course, oh my gosh. Um, when their relationship is brutally cut short, man, I'm like already invested. Yamaye goes on a dramatic journey of transformation and that takes her first to Bristol, where she is caught up in criminal gang and police riots sweeping the city. Then she goes to Jamaica. Oh my gosh, where her past and present collide. <gasps> wow. Okay. That sounds good. Too bad my library doesn't have it. This next book, I'm honestly not really sure about. And so I'm curious as to how the community will react and how it will be reviewed by those in our community. But it is Children of Paradise by Camilla Gradova. And what it sounds like is that there's this lady, Holly, our main protagonist. She applies for a job at Paradise or The Paradise, which is the oldest cinema in town. And she, you know, has her regular job. And then what happens is that as the weeks pass, um, she longs for the approval of a silent voyeur. And when she finally gains the trust of this cryptic band of oddballs, Holly transforms from silent drudge to rebellious insider mm, intrigue and gradually becomes a part of the paradise, unearthing its secrets and learning its history and haunting its corridors after hours with the other ushers. So, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure about that. I, I'm, I, I don't know. I feel unsure. Okay. <laughs> Next up, we have trespasses by Louise Kennedy. And I really like um, what Publishers Weekly wrote about it. Um, it's basically, if it says it delivers an engaging, if sometimes clunky story, which really kind of tur turns me off to it, of a forbidden affair between a Catholic and a Protestant. That's, that's what I like. Um, during the troubles and I think so we're following following a 24 year old Catholic teacher who falls in love with um, an older married Protestant barrister who has a reputation for defending the rights of Catholics and it seems like the they keep on running into each other and of course this is all happening during the upheaval and murders of the um, the murders claimed by the IRA and the UDA. So there's political upheaval as these two are falling in love. Mm, I don't know. I'm not sure. I like the time period. I like the religious aspect. I'm just unsure about the book. I can already tell that this next book is going to be a problem. Like I already want to read it. It was described in the announcement video as very funny, like very funny. And so I'm just like, oh, 
and it has all of my buzzwords. Oof. So I'm a fan by Sheena Patel. So in this book, a single speaker uses the story of their experience. What experience though? I don't know. In a seemingly unequal, unfaithful relationship as a prism through which to examine the, the complicated hold we have on one another. Mm, does that not sound amazing? With a clear and unforgiving eye, the narrator unpicks the behavior of all involved, herself included, and makes startling connections between the power struggles at the heart of human relationships and those in the world, in turn offering a, offering a devastating critique, oh my gosh, of access, social media, patriarchal heteronormative relationships, and our cultural obsession with status and how that status is conveyed. Okay, and it's short, it's 207 pages. Oh my gosh, okay, this is gonna be, this is gonna be a hard one. This is gonna be a hard one to, to, uh, to pass up. This might be the one that I buy on my Kindle. Sounds really good. We go from the book that makes me want to melt, that one that is really getting in and amongst me, like everything about it, the typography, the cover, the simplicity, like I want it, like I want it so bad. We go from that to the book that like, I don't want to touch with a 10 foot pole and that I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And it's by Laylene, pa Laylene Paul and it's the book Pod. And, um, and so this is her third, this is the author's third hu humanimal, like hum, like, um, and from the perspective of an animal that they have these anthropomorphic um, qualities. And the reviewer from Publishers Weekly said, it's unabashedly anthropomorphic. I'm not really a fan of that technique. Didactic. And then here's the anti buzzword, the thing that I'm like, oh, no. And it it's YA in its vibe. No, I like middle grade. I I don't like YA as much, especially if it's just like YA in its vibe. Like, no, mm-mm. Um, and then despite the graphic content that Paul, the author, admits makes some people want a trigger warning, no, no, that was the nail in the coffin, okay? No. We've gotten to the books that actually my library does have or they're on order. I'll let you know, okay? Well, not I'll let, I'm not gonna let you know every nitty gritty bit of detail, but these are the ones that I have available to me. So the first one is Homesick by Jennifer Croft, the aforementioned translator of Olga Turk, Tur I'm, we're just gonna, of the books of Jacob, okay? I'm so sorry. So Homesick, a personal memoir that tells the, that tells the story of two sisters in Oklahoma Y'all, I don't know, I think it's because, and the y'all comes out as I'm about to say something very American. I like, I like, what is, is this? I can't even get the words out as I'm about to make fun of myself. I do like things set in the US and it's because I live here and I understand it in a way that if, you know, when I read a British novel, there are some things I just miss because I am not British. And so there are some things that I just get, like I'm like, oh, Oklahoma. Like my grandfather was living in Oklahoma for a little while. Like I immediately <laughs> feel connected to this novel. There's bias, I know. Okay, so it's a personal memoir that tells the story of two sisters in Oklahoma, one who suffers from debilitating seizures and the other of who becomes an award-winning translator after she enters college at 15. So it, I am like, I'm not sure if this is an auto fiction book and that's why it made it to, onto the long list or if they're just including, if they're just in, what are, is the Women's Prize including nonfiction now? Or is it just like auto fiction, you know, I don't know. I'm not really sure. Wait a second. Okay, it was a little blip. It was a little blip. It was it was just like in the actual Kirkus review. Um, it sells it says it tells the story of two sisters, Amy and Zoe. And so one of those sisters becomes an award-winning translator, which I think is like the auto-ish fiction of this book, but I don't think it's it's an actual memoir of her life. It is an it's a fictional account that has some ties with Jennifer Croft's life. I'm I'm interested. I think it's it sounds it sounds intriguing. I'll probably wait for reviews, okay? 
The next one is Stone Blind by Natalie Hayes. And I already had heard about this because it is a retelling of Medusa. And what's interesting is that I was, I have been, this year, I have been all of a sudden really interested in ancient Greek, re, ancient retellings. I don't know. I, I read Silence of the Girls by Pat Barker, and then I own Madeline Miller's two books. Um, those did really well on the Women's Prize. Um, the Song of Achilles, I believe, won. Could have been the other one. Who, Circe, maybe that one. I don't really know. I think it was the Song of Achilles that won. And, um, you know, I'm really into this, like, feminist retellings of books. You know, it's just like, I, I love the empowerment that's, you know, really kind of woven throughout these books. And so I knew about this because it had been making the rounds on BookTube. And, of course, when they're like, it's an ancient retelling, I'm like, huh, what? What is that? Retelling of what? Oh, okay, Medusa? <laughs> Do not tell me anymore. I'm already interested. And then now it's... Now it's, um, you know, it's a retelling of, it, now it's made it onto the long list for the Women's Prize for Fiction. And so it's really, really, really tempting. So I did already put this on hold because I'm interested. Let me read you the one sentence blurb that this is about. So, um, attacked by Poseidon in Athelene's temple, Medusa, the most beautiful of the Gorgon sisters, is punished um, and is transformed into a monster whose gaze will turn any living creature to stone forcing her into a life of solitude um, until uh, Perseus embarks upon a fateful quest. Oh, I don't know. It just sounds good. It sounds good. If you've read it, let me know what you've thought. Mm, it just sounds really good. All right, next, my library has a bunch of copies of this book, 16 copies, and there are 65 people on hold for it. So I don't think that I will actually get my hands on a library copy, and I'm feeling really mixed about this book because I liked but didn't love a previous book that this author wrote, and I have a very vocal commenter that said that they were very disappointed by this book, and it's uh, Barbara King Solver's Demon Copperhead. So this is, takes place in, um, in America in the Southern Appalachia Mountains, um, or in the Southern Appalachia, it doesn't say mountains, um, where it is about a young boy who's um, born to a teenage single mother living in really uh, poor conditions. And it basically, he goes on this journey where he goes through the foster care system, child labor, derelict schools, athletic success, addiction, disastrous love, and crushing losses. Now, interestingly, it's just like, it's a play on David Copperfield, but I haven't read David Copperfield, so I feel even less connected. And then with the feedback that I've gotten about this novel, I'm just not um, champing at the bit to get to it, you know? Like, I'm just not. Next we have Cursed Bread, which I wasn't interested until this very second like as I'm sitting here chatting with you all. So it is, it says it's about a baker's wife and it seems like, you know, everything is fine and pleasant until it's not. And I just like this. So one of the paragraphs says, um, beneath the tranquil surface of daily life, strange things start happening. Six horses are found dead in the sun drenched field laid out neatly on the ground like an offering. Ooh, widows seeing their lost husbands waking up, waking up the moonlit river, coming back to claim them. My gosh, I don't know. Maybe it'll be too creepy for me. And then when you know the last of like how great this book is is going to be. This is what it says about it: audacious and mesmerizing. Curse bread is a fevered confession, an entry into memory's hall of mirrors, a fable of obsession and transformation. <laughs> And then it says Sophie McIntosh, our author, spins a darkly gleaming tale of a town gripped by hysteria, envy like poison in the blood, and desire that burns and consumes. Like, that is just delicious coffee. Like, did you pluck that from my soul? <laughs> hard to say no. It's so hard to say no. All right, next up we have The Dog Up North. And this is on order at my library and it's by Elizabeth McKenzie. This seems like the lighthearted one on the list, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, the cover is kind of 
um, is is showing us that you know, these bright yellows and it just seems very cute and light. And so um, it says, here's what Library Journal had to say about it. Her marriage may be done, her job tossed aside, her mother and stepfather father long missing, and her doctor grandmother under investigation. But optimistic Penny still believes in fresh beginnings. Hey. And as Penny goes on that journey, it's an offbeat one. So, you know, again, it has that very light mood, which I feel like the Women's Prize always puts something on there that's sort of quirky or unusual. One that doesn't quite fit in with all of the others. Another debut, and it is Wandering Souls by Cecile Pinn. And this is a historical fiction work. It is, um, according to this blurb, it is a luminous, boldly imagined debut novel about three Vietnamese siblings who seek refuge in the UK, expanding into a sweeping meditation on love, ancestry, and the power of storytelling. Um, I mean, it sounds interesting. <laughs> it does. I, oh, even though it's sweeping, it's only 240 pages. It's quite short. Hmm. Oh my gosh. I'm like, I'm like reading as I'm filming. I'm like, oh my gosh. So it says through, told through lyrical narrative threats. Oh my gosh. Historical research, voices from lost family and notes by an unnamed narrator determined to chart their fate. Wandering souls captures the lives of a family marked by war and loss, yet relentless in the pursuit of a better future. Like, all these sound so good. This debut has really caught my eye. I'm really, really curious about it because it is, it, the tone is supposed to be darkly humorous. Yes. And it just sounds like a Shelley book, okay? It just does. If the humor, if the humor in this copy is anything like what we're actually gonna see on the page, I'm here for it. So this is what it's about. Five years ago, Gita lost her no good husband, as in she actually lost him. He walked out on her and she has no idea where he is. But in her remote village in India, a rumor has it that Gita killed him. And it's a rumor that just won't die. It's so good. Okay, it turns out that being known as a self-made widow comes with its with some perks. No one messes with her, harasses her, or tries to control <coughs> Mary. It even says, uh huh, Mary, her. It's even been good for business. No one dares not to buy her jewelry. Freedom must look good on Gita because now other women are asking for her expertise, making her an unwilling consultant for her. Her, for husband disposal but not all of them are asking nicely I mean it just sounds light funny fun feminist I just love it okay I just love it I have two novels to go and these are the two novels that I'm actually the most interested in um, and the first one is Memphis by Tara M. Stringfellow. My friend Frazier loved, like, loved this novel. He was going on and on about it and was wondering why more people weren't talking about it and then here it, and he was saying this, like, last summer. <laughs> and then here it shows up on the, on the long list for the Women's Prize. He described it as the love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, he described as like a shorter, more impactful version of that book. And um, yeah, it's not super, it's not a super long book. It talks about women and women's issues. It's set in 1995. And it talks about women's issues, especially from about, especially being a black woman living in the US and what that looks like and some of the unique struggles that they go through. So I've been interested in it since <laughs> Frazier talked about it. Unfortunately, it kind of slid off my radar, but now it's popped back on. Finally, the book that I actually got correct, which is exciting, and it's The Marriage Portrait by Maggie O'Farrell. And this is a historical fiction work set in the 1550s. 1550s? What a am I? <laughs> so it's um, set, it's in Florence during this time. It's about a young du duchess na named Lucrenza. And just as she has exited her child, her girlhood, so she's just barely become a woman, she marries the ruler of Ferrera and is now in an unfamiliar court where she has one duty to provide an heir and she has to fight for her very survival. I've heard great things about this and yeah, I don't know. This is, 
Again, like uh, Memphis and The Marriage Portrait are at the tippiest top of my list. I gotta go. My children are starting to argue. That is my cue. Let me know what you thought. How did you react to the Women's Prize? I'd love to know. Um, thank you so much for hanging out with me. <laughs> I really, really gotta go though. So I will see you all next time. Bye.